at Luke 1, and we're also going to look... Um, we're also going to look at the book of John and look at kind of how they introduce the whole setting and look at kind of how the writing is going to take place. And then next week we're going to start to look a little bit, of the, little bit at the genealogy um, and probably a little bit of the birth um, or leading up to the birth um, of Christ. But today, and I've got a PowerPoint, we have a ton of verses. We'll probably skim over a few of them just because there is so much to go through. Um, but I did put some on the screen. But we're going to start our lesson with Luke 1, 1 through 4. And I'll be reading out of the ESV, so if you have another translation, um, just for reference. But also during class for all of our visitors, if you want to interrupt because you have a good point or a good thought or something you think could benefit the class, by all means interrupt me. I will not be offended. Um, I will love it, especially if you have a great point. So in Luke 1, going through verses 1 through 4, it says this. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and missionaries or ministers of the word have delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theolopus. Can you pronounce tonight? That you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So I think the first thing you can notice with this, when you look at Luke, um, you could ask yourself, why is Luke thoroughly fitted? Why is Luke um, equipped to write this gospel? And I think it's a twofold thing when you really look at it. One fold definitely applies to Luke, and it was because he um, he closely followed, he closely watched, right? And then when you think about that and you put that into our life today, um, if we thoroughly follow the teachings that we have here before us in the Bible, if we thoroughly follow after Christ, if we truly chase after Him, then what should we be? We should also be equipped to share the gospel, but not only that, we should also be in a living example um, about what living out the gospel looks like in our life, what living out the gospel looks like um, in the world out here. Um, Dale and I, and I'm sure some of the other people here are probably here for PTP, and we both listen to uh, Dan Winkler at 3.30, I believe is what it was. And he was talking about living in an unruly wor world, I believe is how he phrased it. Um, and he was talking about Noah um, and the flood and everything else around it. But we have to be able to be an example in that. Uh, while people, no one, you know, of course, listened to Noah, what was he? He was an example. He kept building. I could only imagine uh, what people thought of Noah as he was building the ark. Um, I laugh every time I think about it, right? People had to think he was crazy. Here comes, this water is coming. This rain is coming. All these things are happening. He, what does he do? He does what? Exactly as the Lord commanded him. He just keeps going and going and going, even though the world thought he was crazy, didn't they? Does, does the world kind of point at Christians and think we're crazy today? Well, you're chasing after something that's not even real. You're chasing after something uh, that's not attainable. Why, do you, why are you going after, after these things? That's not true or, or whatever it might be, right? They want to change what truth is. Yet what should we be doing? Exactly as the Lord has commanded us, because what comes at the end? The reward, the great reward. Heaven is, awaits us, right? So there's no time... Um, there's no time that we should be wasting time when we can be working um, and be serving the Lord who has prepared something so wonderful for us. So we should be equipped, right? We should be equipping ourselves for this daily work um, if we walk with the Lord daily. Now, there's another thing that you can notice um, towards the, well, kind of towards the end. In verse 3, Luke says to, uh, to write an orderly account. And I think it's important to note that's not written in chronological order here, but it's also, but it's written in um, topical order. And so as you look through some of the different Gospels, they arrange things a little bit differently. So you got to do a little bit of uh, back-end work to kind of figure out what the chronological order is, which we'll get into a little bit of that as we go through the life of Christ, and you'll kind of see how some of them fit together. Um, and then also, uh, when you look at um, who Luke dedicates the book to, um, he also dedicates um, Acts to the same person, to Theolopus, right? He says, um, or we don't know a lot about him, I'll say that, but kind of one thing that we can gather is that he, was a, um, he, was, he had been a Greek of high, some high official rank, right? So he was someone of somewhat importance who um, Luke at least writes to here and also writes to in Acts. And as we're looking through some of this, um, Luke says one thing that I think is, um, is fitting not only for who Luke is, is kind of writing to. Of course, he's writing to us as well. He's writing for future 
as well. But he says, may have certainty. When you think about um, truth today, do you have certainty in everything that everybody tells you, right? Sometimes you may because they're credible. Other times you may have zero certainty if they're telling you the truth or not, right? They could have lied a thousand times over before, and so you don't have a lot of certainty. But here he says, you may have certainty, right? So he wants to have a certainty concerning, right, at the end of it in verse 4. What that is, is it's a fixed written record, right? Is anybody here bad with their memory a little bit, forgetting things, if you don't write it down? Anybody love sticky notes? There's got to be another sticky note person here, right? Okay, I know there's some. That's me, right? My wife reminds me all the time of all the things that I forgot about because I do it all the time. I'm like, yes, I will remember to do that, and it couldn't be three minutes later. I've already forgot what I agreed that I would remember, right? And I know I'm not the only guy in here that does that, right? I'm already getting some grins. I'm surprised no wives had pointed at their husbands. But um, he's giving them this official written record, record, right? And so it's not, we're not going to leave it up to... Um, uh, trust to just kind of floating. We're not going to leave it up to um, just trying to pass it on orally, right, with traditions, or just up to our memory, right? Luke says, I'm going to give you a written record, right? A written record. That way you can, you know everything and it's right there before you can read over it and read over it and read over it. Um, and then he says also in vo verse 4, he said the things, right? He says that you may have certainty concerning the things. Well, what are the things that, that Luke is talking about? It's the gospel facts, right? The things that you're going to see in this, right? And when we think about the things um, that, he, that he is writing to us, it's not mere opinions, um, and it's not just some random ideas, but instead, what is it? It's facts from above, right? Isn't it facts from the Father? Um, it's, not, it's not something variable, right? Um, it's not something that we even get to change, right? It is simple facts from the Father, and it's a pure and perfect truth. Isn't that wonderful? In the world that we live in today, truth is just fluid, right? It's about as fluid as the river um, that runs all the way back down um, towards the interstate, right? That's how fluid the world has made truth. But with Christ, what is it? It's pure and perfect. Um, he's the same yesterday as he is today as he is tomorrow, isn't he? And it's a beautiful thing. Um, and so as we go back up towards the top into verse 1, when it talks about, it says... Um, Let's see, it says, narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. So what is Luke talking about here? What has been accomplished among them? And if you flip to Acts 3.38, we'll see if I got all my, or 3.18. I'm dyslexic for our visitors. I will do that probably a couple times a night, so y'all watch out for me. What does it say in Acts 3.18? It says, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. You know what's beautiful about our Father? You know what's beautiful about Christ? When He makes a promise, what happens? He keeps it. He keeps it. It's fulfilled, isn't it? Well, y'all ever had a promise made to you and it's been broken instantly? All the time, haven't you? But you know what? You don't have that with Christ. You don't have to second guess if He's going to change His mind. You don't have to second guess if He's really going to fulfill that. You know He's going to fulfill that. Isn't that wonderful that um, He's told us all these things... Right? We're going to have persecutions, we're going to have trials, we're going to have uh, difficulties while we're here on earth. Right, Things might not always be uh, sunshine and rainbows, as some people would say. Right, But what comes next? What has He promised us next if we remain faithful? Heaven. We don't even have to second guess it. We just know it's coming. We can have what? Certainty in that. Isn't that beautiful that you can have certainty with what can lie ahead? It's a beautiful thing. You don't have to guess, you don't have to wonder, right? We know what God has promised us. And so G our God and Jesus never breaks a promise, right? They make it, He withholds it. And then as it goes on, it says, things accomplished. And then it also says, um, starting in verse 2, just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses. And so just as those, if you look at Hebrews 2 verse 3, it says, how shall, we or, let's see. Yeah. how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to by us, attested to, attested to us by those who heard. When we think about this, it was first, it was a living example, right? Christ came down. He gave us a perfect example of exactly how we should live a perfect life, right? Was He not the most beautiful and most perfect example? 
There was eyewitnesses. There was people that witnessed that. There was people that wrote that down. That's how we have it today. And we can study those things. And then at the end of it, in Hebrews 2, 3, it says, those who heard. What comes by hearing? Who was it that said it? Faith. Faith comes by hearing. There's twofold to that. We have to be good listeners. And we have to be able to hear exactly what Christ is telling us in this, right? That's something that I think all of us can struggle with if we start to become a little bit stubborn or a little bit prideful, right? Sometimes a verse might be a little bit hard for us to accept, right? It could be challenging to us. It could be something that um, is different than how we were taught when we were growing up. Um, it could be something that uh, contradicts a way that we like to live our life today, right? So we have to be open to hearing it. The other thing that you have to do in order for someone to hear it is what do we have to be doing? Deliver the message. I love it. Thank you, DJ. It's a good prayer, too. Superstar team today. It's a good crowd today. I love it. We have to be speaking the message, right? And what message are we speaking? It goes back to what the truth is, right? He's given us gospel facts. It's not opinion. We don't have to insert our own opinion, right? We have His beautiful gospel facts. And then it says, from the beginning, and we're still in Luke 2. And it says, from the beginning. So they were there from the beginning. Um, and in John 15, 27, it says, And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. So why does Luke and, and, and the other apostles, what were they? Were they eyewitnesses? Were they a credible account? Absolutely. And they were there with him from the beginning. And as we go into looking at how they were eyewitnesses, you can see it in 2 Peter 1, 16, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths. Do we get that today? Do we have the world trying to cleverly devise stuff to try to pit us against the truth? Oh, did you see this verse? It contradicts over here, right? But what have they done? They've left off all the context clues about what that verse actually means, right? And you can see that all throughout the world today. So we did not follow cleverly devi devised myths uh, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of what? Of His majesty. We didn't fall for those, those clever things over that they were throwing at us, right? But we made known to who? To you, what two things? The power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Twofold. Power and coming, right? And what, what was He coming to do? We're about to dive into all this. He was coming to not only be an example before us, but to what? That was a question. I'm looking for an answer. What was his ultimate goal? Seek and save. Seek and save. He came to seek and save the lost, right? And he came to be... Um, he came to be the ultimate sacrifice for us. And as you also continue on in 1 John 1, 1 through 3, it says this, That which from the beginning, right? So it goes back to the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, right? Which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, to which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Don't y'all love fellowship? It's a beautiful thing, right? It's something that, in a way, during COVID got stripped away from us, wasn't it? Pulled apart, right? Everyone got put into their own little... Uh, a circle, right? You could say everyone got separated, right? The fellowship kind of disappeared. Fellowship is a beautiful thing. We should have fellowship with who? One another. And we have fellowship with one another. Who else are we also having fellowship with? Christ. With the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Isn't that the most beautiful fellowship you could ever have in life? I mean, I say, I've said this probably the last three weeks in a row. You can have all the friends that you want here on earth, and you can have all the best friends that you, that you possibly can have here on earth. And you can even have your best friend forever. And that best friend forever could 100% lie to you, hurt you, whatever it might be, and they might not truly be your best friend forever. 
But you know who your true best friend forever really is? Christ. That's the most perfect best friend forever you could ever have, right? Need a little, little BFF bracelet, don't we? The best friend forever. He's always there for you. He's always there for you. And I love Acts 4.20. And I think this applies to us today. And um, DJ mentioned it during his prayer that we can have the courage to share it. Acts 4.20. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. I don't know how we're not more eager to share this. Do we know what this, this right here entails for our future? Right? We can say it. We can internalize it. We know what this means, right? We know that this talks about a place that is so perfect and so marvelous. It's called heaven. How are we not more eager to share that? Think about what this means for the world. Dale mentioned this, I believe it was Sunday morning. We get so wrapped up into thinking that we can do this or we can do that or we can vote for this person or we can change this policy over here to try to change the world. You know what changes the world? Injecting Christ. Injecting the true truth right here. This is what can change the world. I don't know. We, we get, I, guess we, I guess we think we're, we're a little bit better than we really are, right? We think we maybe have a little bit more wisdom than what we really have. And we think that we can change all these things based off of what we've thought in our head. But what has Christ given us? He's given us truth, hasn't he? Truth into what? All knowledge. He's given it right here, right? This is how we change the world. How can we not be, as Acts 4.20, more eager? How can we not but speak? Why would we not want to speak about it? It's such a beautiful truth, such a beautiful example. How can we not want to share it with the people we work with? How can we not want to share it with our family? How can we not want to share it with the people at the restaurant or the gas station or wherever we may see them? How can we not want to tell them about the beautiful love of Christ and Him wanting them to be with Him? One of the final, th one of the final things that, cro that Christ did on the cross was ask for forgiveness for those that were mocking and beating Him. Father, forgive them for they what? For they know not what they do. Why would He say that? Where did He want them to be? With him. Isn't that crazy? Put yourself in those shoes. Is that what you're saying at the very end? Father, will you please forgive these people that have just beaten me, mocked me, spit on me, and now put me on this cross? I'm not sure that's what I would be saying. But Christ did. Right? Hell was not made for us. Heaven was. And that's what we have to really remember whenever we're speaking to the community. No one in this community... No one in this world was made to go spend eternity in hell. That's not who He made it for. He made heaven for us. So we need to be telling people about this. And we can also be a perfect example for them. Or, I don't mean perfect. We can be a good example of Him as we live um, out our life. 1 Peter, 1, 5, 1 Peter 5, 1 says this, So I exhort the elders among you... As a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as partakers in the glory that is going to be revealed. So he's setting the scene, right? The glory that is going to be revealed. And as we go into this, the next word that, that Luke mentions in the first chapter, going back to it, and this is um, in verse 2, towards about the middle of verse 2, he says, ministers. When you think about... Um, Sharing the message. Who's a minister? I'm so glad you said that. Who do we sometimes say is the minister? We got any preachers in here? Preachers ought to love this quote. Same as quote, right? The preacher's not the only minister to church. And if he is the only minister to the church, that's not good. A little bit of heart trouble, right? We're going to need some heart. We're going to need some open heart surgery, aren't we? Who should be ministers? All of us. All of us should be ministers, right? Yeah, the person speaking at the pulpit can, can be a minister. They absolutely should be, right? But what about everyone else sitting in the pews listening? 
Should we not be taking in the messages? Should we not be um, examining the text for ourselves? Should we not be working our own salvation as the Bible teaches us? And then what? Sharing it, ministering to one another, right? Showing love to one another because Christ first shared it with us. So, in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 1 Corinthians 4 1, it says, This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. How should one regard us as a servant? What was Christ when he came down to earth? Was he a king? Didn't they want to make him an earthly king? Didn't they? But what, what, did, what, did, what did Christ stop and take a moment to do, even to the person that was going to betray him? What act did he do? Washed feet. Humbled himself. He was a servant to those, right? We should be servants to our community, right? We should be living out that servant life um, that Christ has called us to live. As you go into ministers, ministers and all of us should be sharing a word. And it says that in verse 2. I'm going to read verse 2 just for a quick recap. But it says, Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitness and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. And so now we're looking at the word. And if you look at Mark 4, 14, it says this, The sower sows what? The word. What are we sowing today? Are we sowing our opinion or are we sowing God's truth? I hope we're sow sowing God's truth, right? A lot of people want to sow their opinion, right? You have your self-help books and everything else, right? You know what's a great self-help book? The Bible. It's beautiful. There's no errors in it, right? It's a marvelous thing. It all connects together. What are we sowing? And what happens when we sow? We sow and then what comes next? Starts with a W. Water. Dale's whispering. It. He's, I guess he's scared. I've got him scared. He won't say it. Water, right? And then what happens potentially after we sow and we water? Hopefully, hopefully it grows. God gives the increase. So what does that mean we should be focused on doing? Sowing, watering. Sowing and watering. Sometimes I think we can get focused and fixated on the, now let's grow. And I'm going to put miracle grow all over this, and I'm going to see how fast it can grow, right? And we start thinking, I'm going to make this grow. Who makes it grow? God does. What's our role? Sow water. Sow water. Repeat, right? Keep sowing. What are we sowing? The Word. The beautiful, it's right there before us, right? So if we're going to sow the Word, what, what, we, what must we also be doing? Digesting the Word, studying the Word, knowing what the Word is, right? Uh, there are some places, I mentioned this last week, depending on where you work, uh, you might not be able to take a Bible into it. Anybody work at a place you can't take a Bible into or you can't openly have a Bible study? What about that? Is that a hindrance to us? Some people could look at it. It's all about perspective, though. What can you do if you can't take a Bible in? I hope you've written it on the tablet of your heart. Because they can't stop you from walking in the door, can they? I guess they could technically if it was private, right? But you can be a walking Bible if you've studied enough, right? Can't you be a walking example? That's what it's all about. It's all about perspective. Um, and then the last word, we've, which we've briefly mentioned, um, it says, Eyewitness and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. Then in verse 3 it says, It seemed good to me also, having followed all things, all things, closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theolopus, that you may have certainty, right, coming back to that word certainty, coming uh, concerning the things you have been taught. Acts 2.36, we all know the verse just shortly after this, don't we? What about Acts 2.36 that says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made Him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Could you imagine hearing that message and you're the one that, that blood's on your hand? But who is the message open to? 
those same people. The forgiveness was open to them. The message was open to them. So we can be for certain that, he, that um, God has made Him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And what happens right after this? What do they all cry out? What shall we do? Could you imagine? You've just killed the Son of God. Man, you want to talk about a big oopsie. You've just killed the Son of God, right? I always, I've, I've joked about this numerous times, not that it's really a joke at any means, but it's just kind of, it, it makes me laugh thinking about if I could just watch Satan's demeanor during this whole ordeal, like on a TV. It'd be a wonderful reality TV show. Um, he's sitting there, he's so excited, he thinks he's conquered. He's the guy trying to finish the marathon, and he's celebrating around the last turn, but he hasn't quite crossed the finish line yet. And he's celebrating, counting his victory. And then someone ran right by him and stole the victory from him. He thought he won. And then he just opened up forgiveness to all of us. It's a beautiful thing. Let's move into our second thing we're going to say tonight, which is John 1, 1 through 18. I'm going to speed up just a little bit and read through this so we can actually finish all of it. John 1, and I'll have it up here. It might be kind of small if you all struggle to read that, but you can follow along either way. So John 1, 1 through 18 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through Him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God." And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. I'm not even flipping through these, am I? And we have seen His glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was He of whom I said He was he who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from, his, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known." Isn't it beautiful that He made Him known? When you look at this, the Word was with God. What does that mean? I mean it, wasn't, it means it wasn't before, nor was it coming after God. But what was it? But with Him. With Him where? At the beginning. It was God. It wasn't more. It wasn't less. What was it? Was God. The uh, New Testament often speaks of Christ as the Creator. And you can see this in John 1, 10, which we just read. He was in the world, and the world was made what? Through Him. Yet what? The world did not know Him. Did not know Him. What about in 1 Corinthians 8, 6? It says this, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and from whom we exist. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. 
What about Colossians 1.13? He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Hebrews 1, 2 is the last one for this. But in these last days He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created what? Created the world. Y'all love these mountains? I'm sure that's why a lot of the visitors have come there. You all talked about going over the mountains. I know you all went to Klingman's Dome. It's beautiful. You all drove right through Klingman's Dome. I don't know if you knew that's where it was, but if you went over the line, it's Klingman's Dome. It's beautiful. It's one of the highest points right through there. If you go up to the tower, it's one of the highest points in the Smokies. Actually, I think it is the highest point in the Smokies. It's beautiful. You can see so much. The person that we get to communicate with did what? Created that. Yet we get stressed out and worried about all kinds of things in this world. And who can we lift up our concerns to? Who's there to comfort us? the person who created this entire world. It's beautiful. Hit me with it, DJ. I see that part of God's grace is also revealed to us at the beginning of John. He says that the Word was with God, even in the beginning. And as you started your lesson off talking about what the Word is capable of doing, they will save our souls, James will teach us. And all the Scripture will save our souls. So the Word, the, the thing there, So before man had this opportunity to even mess up, which was going to happen, God already had the answer there. He already had the word in place. It's there. Christ was there. The creating agent of the world already contained the answer for our sin. The power of God's love for us, the grace that shown even that just in the beginning of John, is just incredible to me to see that. It's beautiful, and I was looking for the one now, and I can't even see it. It's right in the middle. But it talks about how... Um, it talks about how he actually came before him. But what was John? Was John older or younger, physically speaking, than Jesus? He was older. But how did Jesus come before him? Because he was here in the beginning. Right? Jesus came how many months after? Six. Y'all get some Bible students. Look at this. Y'all have to get up here and teach. Six months yet, but he came what? He came before he came before John. So how is the life of Jesus light to men? (laughs) I like that laugh. You got a good answer, I can tell. How is How is the life of Jesus light today? What do we get from that life? Say it. Say it, Dale. Everything. Everything. In what sense does it make sense that a person could die, yet give life to everyone. There you go. He's opened it. He's made it available to every single one of us. Every single one of us. And when I, when I reference that verse um, from Acts 4.20 about how can we not speak... The verse, if there's a verse that i got to gripe with, and members know this, I've said it numerous times, the verse that just eats me up that I just can't stand in the Bible is the narrow and the wide gate. Few will find it. That eats me up. Why can't everyone find it? I want everyone to find it. I don't want anyone to miss it because I can read and know what's ahead. That tears me up to know that few will what? Find it. It's hard to get to. What, 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 what must that mean for us? What must we be doing? Do we want our loved ones to make it? If we love them, are we telling them about it? Or are we making sure they like us on earth? Right? I don't want no one to be mad at me. Do you have a point? Go for it. I'm talking about the death of Jesus and bringing us life. And Jesus explained that through the beginning of John.
what should our life do? Should reflect Christ. Should bring glory to Him, right? Should we be trying to bring glory to ourselves? You were saying earlier about how all of us are ministers. And the reason behind that is because what ministry is, is a service. The scripture that's brought up, 1 Corinthians 5 and 1, in the King James Version, it even renders that as service instead of ministry. And that's, that's what our life should be in service. goes back to Noah that I mentioned earlier, right? Doing all that God has commanded us. We also should know from Scripture that, that, that we should not count that as burdensome. Why should that not be a burden to us? It's good for us. It's good instruction. It's good directions, right? I made this joke last week. Um, you're trying to put together, I don't know, a home office or a new uh, TV console and you get those directions and they are... Uh, so confusing, half the time you might as well not even open them, right? Um, at least, I mean, why would you open them, right? You've got to try to solve it yourself first, right? But don't you want to open this instruction manual? Isn't this an instruction manual you want to take time to read? Right? This is the one you want to open, right? This is the one you want to make sure you don't leave closed. For the last five to ten minutes, I want to think about this. When we start to think about the life of Christ. In verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In verse 16 it says, for from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Where did Jesus leave to come to here? Left perfection to come to here, did He not? To come be with what kind of world? Who here wants to leave a place where you don't, have to, you don't have to deal with all the mess that we have here on earth? Would anybody voluntarily do that, right? Christ did. To do what? To come to not only be an example, but to what? Sacrifice Himself. For what? The betterment of His creation. And you can look at different scriptures... What are we to Him? His own possession. I've used this example a few times, but what is that one special thing that you have, probably at your house, that is just your special prized possession? You put it in the most special place, right, right there on the mantle. You want everyone to see it. It's your special possession. Christ knows who you are. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Uh, my wife and I were joking. I don't know if you all seen the news or not. Um, Alabama fans, you'll love this. Uh, do we have any Alabama fans? I always try to make fun of Alabama fans when I get a chance because I think it's fun. No one raised their hand. We don't have one Alabama fan. Any Auburn fans? Man, tough crowd. Oh, well, I'll be, yes, Auburn fan. Okay, see, so she'll, we can let her make fun of Alabama fans. It'll be great. Peyton Manning is coming back to be a professor at UT, right? The first thing my wife said was, man, how crazy would that be to have Peyton Manning as your professor and he would know your name? How cool would that be? And which is like the last thing I thought. I was like, that'd just be a crazy class to be in, right? That was my first thought. But she's like, man, it'd be so cool that Peyton Manning would know your name. You know how crazy it'd be if the creator of the world knew your name? What about if he did know your name? What about if he calls you his own possession? Isn't that something? How are we living our life today for the person that wants to call us his own possession? For the person that loves us so much that he sent his only son to die a gruesome death on a cross 
so that we could have that forgiveness to spend eternity with Him. How are we living our life today? Are we being an example to our community? Are we able to speak about this beautiful message that's been put here, right here before us? The greatest love story. Boy, there's been some great authors that have written a lot of good love stories. They've been bestsellers all throughout, right? All these great fictional stories. Sometimes they're even real, right? You hear about all the blind side issues now with the movie The Blind Side? Boy, that beautiful story might not be as so, right? But you know what is so? This beautiful story. And this is the one that we should be sharing. So as we leave here this evening, think and ponder about the life of Christ and what that means in your life. Because He came and lived His life, what does that mean for our life today? What can we take from His example and apply it to our life today? What does that open up for us because He first came down here and lived? What does that mean that He knows your name? So if you have something that is, that is weighing on your heart, turn it over tonight. Life is way too short uh, to let any single person on earth steal your happiness or distract you from the salvation that is right ahead. Can you imagine that? Letting someone here on the world distract you from a beautiful salvation that is right there before you. Keep your eyes focused on the cross. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus and what He's provided for us and the life that He gave for us. Likewise, if you, have, um, if you haven't surrendered your life to Christ, you can also do that this evening. And it opens up all these things that we're about to study throughout His life. He didn't come and uh, live on this world and be an example and die on a cross just so you could continue to live a life separated from Him. He did that, that way you could be what? United with Him. Because that's what He desires. He desires all of us to come to a what? The knowledge of truth. He wants us to be with Him in eternity. Isn't that awesome? Y'all have anybody in your life that you just want to spend every single waking second with? Christ does. Right? He wants us to be there with Him for eternity. It's a beautiful thing. So if you have anything on your heart tonight that you want to turn over, that you want to lift up prayers for, or if you just want to simply give your life to Christ, you have that opportunity tonight as we stand and as we sing. Brian? Just as-